You know, there's a, I was uh, communicating yesterday with a colleague of mine in Poland. So she right now is writing about the, just, uh, the polarization in Poland. And in fact, polarization in many countries in Europe and how the extreme right is mobilizing and mobilizing around anti-immigration and mobilizing around foreigners and mobilizing in a way that is just really, really, really dangerous and troubling. And meaning that um, people having lots of marches, people uh, attacking uh, immigrants, people attacking, uh, these are uh, white people, uh, attacking people who are not white, um, people who don't think like them, and really seeing uh, many countries getting divided in a way that's very similar to how the United States has gotten divided, um, but also in more profound, but really even in more profound ways. And for somebody like myself who has this idea, and I might be wrong, you know, this person is doing all the work on dying and death could completely be wrong, but I have this idea, just like the six people up here and myself were probably, my thinking is we're likely all going to the same place um, because of that. It's actually really kind of scary when people have these ideas. And, um, but the ideas are real, right? Because human beings are prone to protecting whatever it is around them. You know, we're prone to protecting our homes. And so for me, I'm gonna protect my home, right? I have a lock on the door, and if somebody tries to break in, I'm gonna try to stop them, that sort of thing. But other people see their nation as their home with the borders and so on, right? So for them, they're protecting the home in a different way um, from maybe other people from other nations who are coming in. And the key thing uh, about white nationalism, when you hear about white nationalism, what's really important, I just wanna walk you through a few things because I think it matters because this is not gonna go away. The, the conflict, the race conflict that we're seeing is probably gonna get a whole lot worse before it gets better. So let me walk you through some of the things that I see that actually we probably might wanna put our attention on. So the idea of white nationalists is that the fundamental enemy are Jewish people. Jews are the enemy. Black people, Hispanic people, Asians, indigenous peoples, they don't, they don't really matter that much. So white nationalists are concerned about Jews. And the reason they're not concerned about anybody else besides Jews is because all of those other groups are the lower races. They're, they're, they're so inferior in this belief system. They are so inferior that they don't have the power to take down the white, quote, race. But Jews do. And Jews are really, really dangerous according to their belief system. Jews have this plan. And the plan to undermine white people and take over because it's a global conspiracy on the part of Jewish people according to this perspective. And the plan is to infiltrate white society with lesser inferior beings who are from the continent of Asia and Africa and the Americas. And so once we can dilute the bloodlines and once we can dilute the culture, once Jewish people can do that, then they can take over the final takeover of society and take over all white people and push white people, the good white people, whatever, to the side. Okay? That's the thinking of white nationalists. So, which is why, for example, let me show you a couple things. Um, this was a poster from the Charlottesville rally from a couple of years ago when white nationalist groups were all coming together and they were uniting in Charlottesville on August 12th, right? And look, he's got the sledgehammer and he's, what, he's gonna crash the Star of David the primary symbol of Judaism. There's nothing on there about white people. It's to end Jewish influence in America, the daily stormer. So black people 
we'll often have this idea, hey, these white nationalists, you know, this is the KKK and they hate, you know, black people. Listen, yeah, they don't like you, but you're irrelevant to them. You're like nothing to them. This is the enemy right here. This is the enemy. And so then we look at these rallies. Okay, we have a Confederate flag because part of Charlottesville is in a retaking the Old South. And, you know, these groups sort of all come together, right? There are lots of people who maybe um, are part of the old clan and now they're in the new clan. And like, they kind of put it together. So they're going to bring their Confederate flag. But most of the symbols are going to be symbols of hatred toward Jews, including the Nazi swastika, right? Look at, okay? So here's another one. So again, we have a Confederate flag. There are a couple of Confederate flags, but really it's Jewish people are the enemy. This is white nationalist ideology, okay? And this is a movement. It's still small in the United States, relatively speaking. But at the same time, we don't necessarily know how small it is. And at the same time, it can grow really fast. And what we're seeing in parts of Europe is how quickly this movement has blossomed and taken off because it breeds on discontent. All movements like this breed on discontent. It gets their power from discontent. And I just saw some data that just came out not only for the United States, but for the world, about the exacerbation of income inequality and how over the past 30 years, the rich are, the, the, remember we talked about this in class, how the profits that are being derived from all of the new revenue that is being generated and how the vast majority of those profits are going into the pockets of the uber rich, not to the pockets of the bottom 40%. So now imagine that you're white and you're working class. And you've been watching sort of manufacturing jobs go elsewhere. And you're watching Korea rise and China rise. And you're watching various cities and peoples in Africa get more prosperous. And you're watching the black and brown community in the United States get more prosperous. But your community, you're watching it shrink. And you're watching yourself get poorer and poorer and poorer. And there's really probably not a chance in hell that you're going to score that really sweet job that your grandfather had, or maybe even that your father had, that allowed them to buy the house that they have. Because you're probably not going to get it. And maybe you're going to do gig work at who knows where, you know, for, for UPS or for Uber or, or whatever, and you're going to make your 25000 a year, and that's really cool when you're 21, but when you're 29 or 30 and you want to get married and you want to buy a house and you're still making 25000 a year and there's not a chance in hell that you're going to go anywhere and you're white and you've watched white people, what appears to be white people, just getting passed over and passed over and passed over because you're looking around at all of this multicultural kind of world that we've created and there's more black people on television and brown people on television and you're seeing just this prosperity, what looks like prosperity, because you know, you're not seeing the poor people in these communities, you're seeing the wealthy ones, and you're looking around your community, and you're just seeing poverty after poverty, and you're seeing this community just really be decimated. And so what are you going to do? You're going to turn your anger and you're going to turn it outward. And then you're going to look for a simple solution. And one solution is, look, the problem is that we've given too much power to black people and brown people. And so look, white people, they're just, they're gonna come at you and they're gonna take, they're taking over and you're, you're being lost and your leaders are selling you out. And you, the only way for you to ever get that prosperity again is to follow us. It's really, really simple. And so these movements, they, they rise and they grow on the basis of this white discontent which is completely understandable. All you got to do is take some drive. Instead of, for those of you, if you live in Philly, like regardless of what you're, if you live like in the, in the suburbs of Philly or, you know, in the suburbs of D.C. or in New York City, don't drive home on 78 and 81 and 80. Take one of these back roads. Take, drive home, give yourself eight hours to get back to Philly and drive right down through rural Pennsylvania and take these two lane roads and go through some of these towns and look at the town that was a prosperous, thriving white community now be decimated into nothing with houses falling apart and the jobs have gone and you know maybe 30 miles away there's this kind of a you know Amazon you know uh, warehouse 
And they just opened 25 jobs where people are making $12 an hour. And that's really about it. And drive through some of these communities and see like, man, what story are you going to tell yourself about how that community got there? And then you turn on the TV and there's all these black and brown people and white people and so on, but like who are doing really, really, really well and your life is shit. And someone comes along with a really sweet explanation And the explanation comes with a swastika. And you don't even really know what that means because you didn't study it in school and you have some idea of Jews and the Holocaust and God knows what. But like, you know, it's just really not part of your life. And so then suddenly this very simple explanation is one that really jumps out for you and it makes sense and here you are. And now we see this rise in this white nationalism. And we're seeing it in Europe. And I'm talking to my friend in Poland. And it's happening in Poland. In fact, they just elected a right-wing government. And people are uniting around these ideologies. And it's really quite troubling. Because we're going to continue to see income inequality in this exacerbation. And then it's all going to start to be a problem as it grows. It doesn't matter that most all of this income is going into the hands of, you know, wealthy white people, but also some black and brown people. But so here, look at this. Here's one of the here's a thing here. Right. So look, um, these are these are white nationalist symbols. Right. It's just one after another. And these are appealing, right? They're going to be appealing to you. If you have no idea what the world is and all you've seen is the life of your family has been undermined and it's falling apart and you don't stand a chance at all of ever being anywhere near where your parents or your grandparents were, this kind of stuff's going to be appealing. And then, look, it's the same thing. The merchandise may vary from time to time, but the merchant's always the same. It's the Jewish guy. The same caricature of of, of the Jewish guy. Hate crime laws, climate change, usury, globalism, porno, feminism. Oh, these are all cultural decay. These are all gender bending lies. These are all the lies that Jewish people from this white nationalist thing and the Jewish people have imposed upon the rest of them. They're just like bringing it in. Robert Bowers is the, if you're from Pittsburgh, you probably know that name. He's the man that committed uh, a little over a year ago that um, killed all of the people at the Jewish synagogue. And so you just read his words, right? And um, just how, you know, really deeply disturbing it is. And, you know, highest. So um, I, think he, I think what it was was that he was... He, he went in, there was a meeting of Hyas, and Hyas is a Hebrew immigrant aid society, and it was founded in the late 19th century to help Jewish people immigrate to the United States who were victims of the pogroms in Eastern Europe. And so, and what they're doing is they're bringing invaders to kill our people. I mean, it's, it's right here. I can't sit by and watch when people get slaughtered. In 1488 is, 14 represents the 14 most important words for white nationalists. And the 14 most important words, here I'll read them. We must secure the existence of our people and a future for white, for our, for white children. And 88 is because HH is the eighth letter of the, H is the eighth letter of the alphabet. And 88 means is Heil Hitler. HH is Heil Hitler. And so this is this homage to Adolf Hitler. And so for, you'll see 1488 a lot by folks. It's really easy to take those words invaders like we start talking about uh, you know people coming up across the border in Mexico and we start referring to that as an invasion of the United States and that just becomes the sort of national lexicon discourse. We hear it on the news and people say it and our leaders say it and then that just fits really nicely perfectly overlaps with this story that's being told by these folks. It's an invasion. And so it doesn't take a lot to get people, here's a line, to say, hey, we have a really, a real serious problem here, to step over the line and say, actually, now we have a serious problem and I'm going to do something about it, just like this guy. I'm going in. I'm going to take over. I'm going to make it happen.